Anne Rita Ledoux from St. Anthony Park Branch Library Association. We are very glad to have you here to address an important uh, community issue around, um, around child care and early childhood and, and, and the tax question as well. Um, so I'm going to give it to Judy now. Okay, well, thank you all very much for coming, and uh, on behalf of the uh, St. Anthony Park Branch Library Association, I'd like to welcome everyone tonight, but especially I want to welcome our guests on our panel, that is Professor Megan Gunner of the Institute of Child Development at the University of Minnesota, who will provide background on the issue of childhood, of early childhood education. We're also welcoming City Council member Rebecca Naker and Daniel Cox from the organization Yes for St. Paul. They will both speak in favor of the measure. And we're welcoming early childhood educator Martha Igueta. Uh, unfortunately, and despite repeated invitations and lots of work on the part of Rita, we were unable to obtain a representative from any of the groups that oppose this measure. We regret their absence, we really do, but we do have official statements from a couple of the opposing organizations which we are making available to the audience. Have those been passed out? I think that's yeah, that would be great if you could do that. Uh, in addition, uh, and I am certainly an objective, non-partisan you know, uh, uh, participant in this uh, event. However, because of the sort of nature of our panel here, I'm going to try to do my best to raise uh, some of the concerns of those who are opposed uh, to the issue in order to give our guests a chance to respond to those issues, the issues involved. So here's how we're going to run things tonight. First, we're going to hear from Professor Gunner, who will talk on the background of the issues. Then we're going to have, and Professor Gunner will speak to us for about five or ten minutes. Then we're going to have, we're going to hear a short statement from the members of the panel. We've asked the members to keep that statement short. We are, uh, perhaps one of the members of the panel will give a statement for all of them. Perhaps they'll each one speak. But please, panel, I'm going to reiterate again, no more than five minutes total, because we want to get to the most important part of the program, which involves you, the audience. You will have a turn to ask your questions. So please start thinking about your questions now. We've passed around cards, or we're passing them around at the moment. And after we hear opening statements from Professor Gunner and the rest of the panel, I will read your questions. But at this point, let me turn the microphone over to Professor Megan Gunner. Thank you. Okay. I kept this pretty informal because I wasn't sure what knowledge level I would have about early development, early brain development in the audience. Those of you who have a fair amount of knowledge, would you be willing to raise your hand and say, yeah, I've heard a lot about how important early... Okay, I sort of know where I'm starting. 25 years ago, um, in the year 2000, the National Academy of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences produced a report on early uh, child development and the importance of early experience that was called Neurons to Neighborhoods. I was part of that study group that wrote that book. Um, and at that time, what we were concerned about was the fact that the incredible gap, which had been there for many years between what we know and what we do for young children, how could we close that gap? What has happened in the 25 years later is the science of understanding early brain development, early biological development, blah, 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 has just grown immensely, and we have come a bit, especially in our state, uh, a bit towards improving what we do for children and families and the quality of education we provide to young children. And we now talk about it as early childhood education and not just uh, babysitting. Okay, our state has done pretty well. I have to, a full disclosure, I am a, hello, I haven't been talking for six minutes. <laughs> uh, full disclosure, I'm a, on the board of Think Small, and I've spent a good part of my career here in the state trying to uh, improve the quality, improve the quality and access to early childhood education. So um, Think Small has not signed on to this, though they helped uh, 
I think Barb Yates helped you sort of begin to put together some of it. Okay, so what do we know about early brain development? First of all, we have this amazing, first of all, genes do matter. You have the genetics that will put together a human brain, not a mouse brain. I hope that is not a big surprise. Once those genetics help you set up sort of the basic structure of the brain, we have evolved. We are what, what's called neotenous. We're born very young. If you remember back to your child, if you had children, the baby lay there, couldn't roll over, couldn't get the hand of the mouth, couldn't do anything for a very long period of time. So long, because you had to do it all for them, right? Someone's got a young child still. <laughs> and this is important for how smart we are as a species, because our brains become what our brains think about and the information they process, so that we become beautifully adapted to the context in which we live. Now, some of that, because our brains organized from the back, which is where you get vision, to the front, prefrontal cortex, which is where you do algebra, back to the front. Um, some of that is reasonably, doesn't take a whole lot of the correct input. Nature didn't want us all to be really blah, right? So you don't need to be able to see too much to be able to set up a brain that knows pattern light and that can process information from both eyes and so on. If you have cataracts, if you have problems, we need to correct those early because we will detect those because these things have sensitive periods. But throughout your early development and the first three to five years are where we set up what we think of as the foundation. The foundation for all learning that will come after. Because as your skills will beget skills. And you know this. The more you know, the more you can learn. The more you know, the more you can understand. And we are able to see this in terms of really what children are able to come to kindergarten and first grade with. And the ones who come knowing a lot more, knowing their language, they learn fast. They don't need to know their ABCs. <laughs> but they need to know how to think, how to reason, how to work and be with others, and so forth and so on. Um, as a little example of that, as a kid, I distinctly remember learning a word. I don't remember what the word was. And all of a sudden, it seemed all the grown-ups were using that word. Now, they'd obviously been using that word, and I just didn't know the word, so I, didn't, I couldn't apprehend it, right? And I thought, I guess I was a psychologist way back when I was three, because I thought, boy, that's really interesting. I wonder if they've been saying it all along, and I just had not heard. But the, that's a really good example of the more you know, the more you can pick up. Okay. Now, we have incredible data now on brain development. You guys, anybody like Hercule Poirot? Yay, and those little gray cells, right. So we're, we, image, we can image the brain, and we, uh, there's a wonderful study that was done about 10 years ago over in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, by people, professors at Madison, where they imaged the brains repeatedly of babies from the time they were five months to three years. And they recorded the uh, social class of the babies. Now, the social class stood in for the amount of stimulation that the children were probably receiving because you know us highly educated people, our kids are just inundated, like overwhelmed by what we are doing. And what you saw is by the time the kids were three, not at five months, but by three, the kids who had a lot of intellectual stimulation actually had more gray matter volume in their brains than the kids who were from the, well, there was a lot of individual variation which probably track the amount of language-rich environment the kids were getting, even if their parents were not wealthy. And this is, of course, exactly what we've been trying to do in the state with scholarships, to help kids who are in environments where they're not getting much stimulation get into three- and four-star rated early childhood education programs to help them sort of have a leg up. Because one of our problems in the state is what? We have a humongous gap learning gap. And the well-educated, the kids of well-educated families are really amazing. They're Garrison Keillor's kids. I guess I shouldn't say that. That joke's old now. Um, <laughs> that's too old, Garrison. Um, they really are phenomenal. And kids who have not had those opportunities are struggling. And they get to school and we cannot seem to close the gap. Why? Because the kids who come to school 
knowing the names of all the dinosaurs, knowing this, knowing that, knowing what a pressure gauge is, whatever, they just are able to absorb more. So the goal we have as a state, I better stop talking, Teresa, is to try to close the gap before it opens. And that's what the idea is of high quality early education, but I have to tell you, we have a challenge. We do not have enough high quality spots. You, we pay early childhood educators what we pay people to walk our dogs. It, it, I mean, it's egregious. The salaries for early childhood educators are less sometimes than the salaries for people who work at PetSmart. So no wonder we don't have blocks of, of brilliant, um, highly educated people wanting to go into that and take in all those student loans and then go make not a living wage. A, a large percentage of our early childhood educators are in some form of welfare because they can't, uh, they can't afford to live on what we pay them. Okay, so we have a problem. It, we need it. I, I like to say that the earlier you're working with children in an educational setting, the more it's rocket science. You do not tell a group of squirmy three-year-olds to sit down, open the book to page 20, and read the story. If you're going to teach them, you catch them where they are, you've designed a creative, exciting environment, you're doing guided learning, you know what concepts you want to teach, and you teach it as they play. And if they go off in another little vein, you go, okay, well, we'll just move from that to center of mass, we'll, we'll learn how blocks so fall over if you find the right center of mass, because that's what they're up to. So you're constantly thinking, you have to know a lot to be a high quality early childhood educator. We need to really make sure we have those slots. I'm going to stop thinking in one minute. We can learn a lot from places that have tried to do something like this. Uh, Quebec, 20 years ago, really did this amazing thing. They made early childhood education free, and they wanted it to be high quality. And there were so many people who wanted to use that that they ran out of high quality spots. And the social pressure was to keep opening up more slots. And so we had families who were well educated and had financial resources taking their kids out of high quality places and putting them into the freer places because it benefited their family. We don't want to see anything like that here. And I know these guys don't want to see anything like that. So I think we have to think very smart and creatively. We can do this. We're Minnesota. Hey, there we go. Stop. We're Minnesota and we can solve a lot of problems. Hello. Um, even if we give away our governor to those guys in Washington. Thanks very much, Professor Gunner. Uh, now we have five minutes for statements from the rest of the panel. Would you like to come up or, or do you want to sit at your place? Whatever would you like. And I'll just let, you know, did you select one speaker or? Okay, you go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am so happy to be here again. My name is Rebecca Naker. I'm a city council member representing Ward 2, so just outside of where we are tonight. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful to uh, the association and to all of you for being here tonight. I was saying just earlier that this is the first forum that there has been on any of the ballot questions on the ballot this year, and there are three in St. Paul. And it is so important to have organizations that are doing this work of informing voters and to have people like you who are willing to take time on a gorgeous Thursday night to come out and listen. So thank you. Um, I am here tonight as a city council member, but I'm also here as someone who was the beneficiary of the quality early childhood education that Dr. Gunner was just talking about. And I am here because my parents had access to quality childcare so that they could both work and send me and my brothers through school. And I am here because as a mom, I had access to high quality early learning for my children, so I was able to work. I had a six week old and a one and a half year old when I started running for city council. And I'm here tonight as someone who cares about our community and not just about solving the problems that are right in front of us right now, the potholes, the streets, the public safety issues. We have a lot of issues in front of us right now. But I also want to do things today that are going to change the dynamic 20 years from now so that those issues that we're dealing with today that started 20 years ago are not being dealt with by the people here 20 years from now. So I want to do both what's right in front of us and what's right in front of us to change for the future. Um, and as Dr. Gunner said, what's exciting to me about this initiative is that there is such a huge gap between what we know 
in what we do. We know what the right thing is to do. We have lacked the political will for so long to do it, and that's what I'm hoping we'll talk about tonight. Thank you, Rebecca. My name is Daniel Cox. Uh, I'm the father of two and a resident of the Hamlin Midway neighborhood. So my youngest is only a month old, and uh, so if I uh, start stumbling over words, it's because I was up till uh, 3.30 last night. Um, so when my spouse and I started having a conversation about having a family and expanding kids, uh, you know, just affordability is the biggest thing that we had to talk about. Uh, right now, our childcare costs are substantially more than our mortgages, you know, so, uh, it is a huge cost burden for families. If you like, if you want to have kids these days, it is very, very expensive. Um, and uh, we're lucky enough to be able to, you know, both work and be able to afford that. But that isn't a luxury that's available to many families in St. Paul. So our kids, you know, we're we're able to help maintain our own financial security and, you know, all of that. But uh, that isn't something that everyone can do. So it's very important to me that uh, we make sure that those opportunities are available to everyone. The other thing, uh, you know, just to follow up on, you know, the points about what we know that works, um, investing in childcare uh, is incredibly well studied to produce really amazing economic benefits. There's the work that Art Rolnick did that demonstrated a 16 to 1 uh, in return, uh, in return uh, on, on investment from public investment in in child care and early learning. And uh, there's recently uh, a new report uh, on the program in Connecticut on child care expansion that showed six to one. So we can make a huge difference uh, for the future economic health of our city uh, with this program as well. Good evening, everyone. My name is Marthy Guerra, and I am a mother of two children. In addition, I'm also a teacher for SPPS. I work in early intervention, which is um, the birth to three program and so this in terms of child care access and quality is really the bread and butter of what I do every day I visit families in their homes and I also support teachers in various child care settings both in-home providers as well as centers across the city and one of the hardest parts of my job is navigating when a parent comes to me and says I, I have a plan to go to work or go to school and the missing piece is childcare. And then we have to have the conversation of, well, that accessibility really depends about if you can afford it or not. Um, and we explore the different funding measures, as Professor Gunnar explained. There are scholarships available. There are benefits through the county. And yet, the wait lists are long. And just yesterday, I received a voicemail from a caregiver who said, Martita, if I had all the money in the world, I know exactly what I would want for my child. And in the meantime, I just need to wait. And that's a really crushing part of this work, is knowing that parents know very well what they want for their children. They know what they got and what they didn't get. And uh, it's really depressing is a not good enough word, but to really think about this issue in terms of those who have means or who, who are able to secure the existing resources are able to have opportunities. And for those who aren't, they get left out. And so um, I care about this issue on a professional level, also on a personal level. I actually moved to Minnesota from California because we couldn't find childcare. Um, and I know how, in, how um, the peace of mind that you can have going off to what you love to do, knowing that your children are well cared for and absorbing all the early learning opportunities that they should have. So thank you for being here tonight. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to dialogue. And thank you all. First of all, I'm going to say thank you for staying within the five minute limit. I am so impressed. <laughs> Okay, um, now uh, if you ladies would co collect the questions that the audience has been uh, writing. If you haven't written down a question but you have one, write it down now uh, and we'll start uh, asking them. Uh, while the questions are being passed to the front, I am going to ask a question myself and that is this. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, the, um, I am passing out the, the wording of the ballot question. Okay. 
And there were also the uh, statements from the chamber. They have those, great. Okay, my first question is, and any of you... Uh, There's also a one-pager and uh, some literature for uh, vote yes over on the table as well. So okay. There's, uh, how come there's no no? Okay. Um, my first question. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Mitra Jalali, Mayor Carter, and the St. Paul Teachers Union, all of whom were invited to be here tonight, none of whom were able to come, so I'm going to stand in a bit for them. All of them have opposed this measure. Anyone on the panel? Presumably all of these uh, people have uh, child welfare close to their hearts. Why are they wrong on this issue? And you right, anyone on the panel? I can, I can start, and then maybe uh, our SPFE member on our panel should take SPFE. Um, I can talk about Mayor Carter and Councilmember Jalali, who are my colleagues. And I'll start by saying that I have the utmost respect for both Mayor Carter and uh, Councilmember Jalali. Um, and I often find myself agreeing with them. Um, but on this issue, I believe that, unfortunately, they're quite wrong. Um, Mayor Carter has had a number of different reasons why he's opposed to this initiative over the seven years on which we've been trying to engage him on it. I wish he were here tonight to speak to those himself. I, I'm not going to speak for him. Um, but two of the most recent reasons why he's opposed um, are, are very um, difficult to understand given the other programs that he has proposed. Um, one of his concerns was that there is no plan for the program. Um, and there is actually a, uh, not only the seven years of work that we've done engaging community members, providers, parents, child care experts, organizations like Think Small, um, but there's also a 48-page detailed plan with a 10-year budget, scale-up, um, enrollment, eligibility, evaluation, all of which is available online, that was presented to the City Council publicly. Um, and that is more of a plan, frankly, than there has been for any one of the initiatives that the mayor has proposed to the council and that we have adopted in the eight years that I've been on the council. The second concern that the mayor and council member Jalali have raised is that the program will not cover all of the children in need. I find this to be a very disingenuous argument because the fact is that no public program that exists in our country covers everybody in need. Head Start does not cover every child in need. There are thousands of kids on wait lists for Head Start in our country. Uh, Section 8 housing vouchers do not cover everyone in need of housing. We know that only one in four families eligible for a Section 8 voucher gets one because of the lack of funding. The mayor's own programs, the Inheritance Fund, the Down Payment Assistance Fund, uh, College Bound St. Paul, and on, uh, do not fully meet the need. And so to say that, I guess the way I look at it is, um, we're standing by a river, we have children coming by who are in the river drowning and in need of help, and Rather than getting a raft and going in and grabbing who we can, we're going to wait until we can build a big enough boat to go rescue everybody and let everybody go by in the meantime. Just doesn't really make sense to me, again, especially given the way the city and our values have guided us to programs in the past. Ooh. And I'll let Martha speak to the State Health Federation of Educators if she wants. I can. Or, or, okay. uh, the program that the that it, you know, Rebecca is discussing that is up on the website uh, was initially based on the recommendations of the uh, legislative early learning legislative advisory committee that was voted on I think a year and a half ago now a while back uh, and uh, you know Councilmember Jalali did serve on that but the mayor was also invited to either send representations or serve himself and declined to do so uh, so you know uh, we can't speak to why he elected not to participate in that process, but you know, there has been an incredible amount of detailed planning work that has gone into this and brought us to this point. And finally, I'll speak as an SPFE member and actually a union steward for my department and building. Um, I was really troubled by the explicit message to voters to vote no on this issue. I had really hoped that the union would engage the members most connected to this issue, which would be early childhood special ed and other early educators in the district. Um, there are two points of concern. I believe one was calling it a voucher program. And to be clear, in the K through 12 education world, I think many people can agree that vouchers are ineffective and problematic at a values alignment level. And because in the birth to five care and education world, we actually have no 
universally available public system for families to access. So nobody gets to vouch out of the universally available free system. In the K-12 world, we do have universally available primary public education. And so that makes sense. We can be against a vouchers in the K-12 model. It doesn't, it doesn't match in the birth to five population. Additionally, um, there was concerns about the privatizing of education. And I want to be just really clear that many parents in SPFE utilize existing child care providers in our city. And so in one of my meetings um, with, with union representatives, I said to them, so the, the in-home providers or the centers that our own families access, are they the enemy? Because essentially they are private businesses. And across our city, we interact in the public and private sector all the time. So um, when we don't have, when we've decided to underinvest for so many years in Birth to Five, um, I feel that these reasons are pretty disingenuous. Um, additionally, we have intended or we have attempted at multiple points to engage um, the union to find a more mutually agree upon um, solution and those invitations have gone um, less than responded to. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. And to be clear, I am grateful to my union for all of the ways it does support me in my work, and this is a difference in a, a point where we don't align. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you know, and I appreciate everyone's answer, but I will point out that I have a stack of questions here. <laughs> the shorter the answers, the more questions we get to. Um, okay, first question from the audience. Among the families who will be eligible, how will the families who receive the subsidy be chosen? This is particularly relevant because I think all of you agree, and everyone agrees, that not all children eligible will be uh, able to be served by this? Yep, uh, great question. So we have been clear that all St. Paul residents with children ages birth to five will be eligible to apply, uh, regardless of immigration status, regardless of special education need, etc. cetera. Um, and if we have more applications, on, and applications will be accepted on, on a monthly basis, if we have more applications than we have dollars, we will be prioritizing families based on a number of factors. First and foremost is income. Um, Parents who are, uh, have children in foster care, parents who are homeless or highly mobile, children with parents who are incarcerated, factors such as that. Income will be the most um, weighted, heavily weighted factor, and uh, the program will fully cover the cost of children whose families make less than 185% of poverty. That's about $58,000 for a family of four. More than half of the children in our city fall in that category. I'll say that again, more than half the children in our city are in families that make less than $58,000 for a family of four. Our program will fully cover the cost for those families. Thank you. Anyone else want to add something? Thing or can I go on? Don't tempt us. All right. <laughs> or, okay. I would, yes. sorry, one thing I would throw in is one of the other things the program includes is development of a online portal uh, that is a one-stop shop to help all parents in the city uh, find care. Because one of the other struggles besides affording care is being able to find it. Uh, and uh, one mm -hmm. of the things that is proposed is the development of this one-stop shop that would act as a resource to all, all parents uh, so that they're able to literally find where spots are available. Because, you know, we can't fix all of the problems with this one program, but we can at least make it easier to apply, uh, find where spots are available, and uh, help, where we, help as we can. Okay? Uh, all right. Next question. I'm going to alter this a little because I know that the uh, plan uh, foresees a gradual expansion of the program. So the question is, how many children will this serve? I'm going to alter it to ask, how many children will this serve the first year? And then presumably it will increase by a factor of 10 to the 10th year. Is that right? Uh, yes. We didn't rehearse who was going to answer the question because we didn't know the question, so that's why you see us doing a little dancing. Um, so there, are, by the way, there are 50 other cities and counties in the country that have started programs like this. So St. Paul would be the first in the state of Minnesota, which is, but not the first in the country. We'd be following these 50 other cities and counties who have started programs for exactly the same reason we're talking about starting a program, which is 
as Dr. Gunner pointed out, the fact that their states may have made progress towards closing the gap and fully funding childcare, but have not nearly gone all the way there. And those cities and counties have gotten fed up with waiting, and they've started their own programs. All of those other cities and counties that started programs either had a pilot year, or they wished that they had. <laughs> and we've learned from that. So our first year will be, a, will be a pilot year. We'll serve 65 to 100 infants in year one. In year two, we'll expand to serve toddlers. And in year three, it will be fully fleshed out to children birth to five. By year 10, we'll be, est and this is all estimates because it depends a great deal on which children apply. Infants are much more expensive to serve than toddlers for a variety of reasons, right? And it's open to all kids, so we can't determine who's going to apply. Um, but our estimates are that we will be serving 25 to 2,900 kids by year 10. And between zero and 10 years, we will serve between four and 6,000 individual kids who would otherwise not have been served. Any other, okay, anything to add, anyone? Okay, all right, I have two questions that are very similar. Um, one is couched, I think, a little more professionally, probably, because it comes from Professor Gunner. <laughs> but the question has to do with how do you determine the quality of the daycare centers, the facilities, to be chosen uh, to be uh, offered these subsidies? How will they be screened? And Professor Gunner, may I quote you? <laughs> yes. uh, Professor Gunner says, how will you ensure that uh, facilities are, ex are accessing four-star and three-star aware rated programs? Well, I don't know specifically what those are, but I think everyone gets the idea, high quality programs. I'll just start and then if others want to add, they can. Um, so currently there's a website and a, a system called Parent Aware, and that is a quality rating scale for early learning providers. And the three or the four star refers to the rating that they've been given due to a number of quality meeting measures. Um, one of the questions that has come up in this process is who can participate or be a beneficiary of receiving children who are funded through this ballot initiative or who can uh, provide care. And one of the really important parts of the plan that Council Member Naker mentioned is that um, this, can, this may include in-home child care providers, it may uh, include community child care centers, it may include Head Start centers, which are oftentimes funded both with federal dollars as well as with um, early learning scholarships. So there are a number of different settings as well as considerations for um, non-licensed but registered um, child care providers and family, friend, and neighbor networks. And so um, the first step would be for any interested provider to register with the city and with the program in order to indicate that yes, they would like to participate and therefore receive children in their care as well as funding. There may be overlap in terms of three and four star existing rating. Um, and then I'll let you take it from there. Yeah. And one of the things that we heard loud and clear when we were talking to providers, and we've again, we've engaged hundreds of providers over the last seven years, is that they, they dispute the idea that there is only one measure of quality, right? If you are a parent who really wants your child in St. Paul Public Schools at three years old, that's, that's quality for you. If you're a parent who wants your child in a child care center, that's quality for you. If you're a parent who wants your child in the Somali language in home child care next door, that's quality for you. There's a lot of different measures of quality, but quality is absolutely non-negotiable. So what we, what we decided early on was that, and there half of our providers in St. Paul do not have a parent aware rating. So if we were to start the program and say, to Martha's point, the only providers eligible are those with a rating, we would be ruling out half of our providers right away. Instead, what we've decided to do is be open to all licensed or legal non-licensed providers of all the different types Martha mentioned and require that they move towards a quality standard over time, and there will likely be a menu of quality standards to choose from. There's Parent Aware, NACI, Head Start, there's a variety of different standards um, that are all similar, and we want to make sure um, Parent Aware is also working to make its own standard more culturally relevant, and we want to give Parent Aware time to do that before we would require that um, of providers. So that's again been solely based on the feedback we've received from providers as we've designed this program. What's the timeline? Um, that's, that's actually, someone has asked that question on one of the cards. Why don't we let it, you know, go in order here? All right, well, thank you. That doesn't answer the full question. So. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, 
So the plan is in the first two to three years, the providers would need to start moving towards that quality standard. There's currently a work group put together of providers who are trying to figure out exactly what that menu would be and exactly how providers would be supported towards that. Um, but we know that in the very first year, it would not be an expectation. Did, did you want to add? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. There's one other thing I would throw in on why it is important to cast a broad net. Uh, so Rebecca mentioned that you know there's many, many other counties and municipalities across the country that have approved similar programs. And we are in the opportunity to learn that lessons from the mistakes that some of them have made. And it turns out one of the effects of if you move all of the three and four year olds into um, one type of program or, uh, you know, uh, the immediate result is that there's no infant care anymore. Uh, because infant care, as has been mentioned, is horrifyingly expensive and it's expensive to pay for, it's also expensive to provide. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that happens if uh, either small centers or uh, centers run up uh, home-based home care doesn't have access to three and four-year-olds anymore is uh, they have to go out of business because that's how they actually break even is uh, because three and four-year-old care is comparatively less expensive to provide. Mm -hmm. So. In some cities, one of the effects was to actually create larger childcare deserts and drive um, the drives predominantly the small businesses owned by uh, people of color out of business, uh, and actually, in many ways, make the situation just as bad or worse, just in a different way. <laughs> Anything more? Okay, I'm going to go on. Um, uh, Professor Gunner, in her opening remarks, uh, talked about the, I think you said, miserable um, wage uh, conditions of child care workers, and I think a number of the rest of you alluded to it. Several of our questions asked, how would this plan address that issue of uh, low wages, and would there be an educational requirement component uh, as well as a wage standard? Who would like to answer that? Uh, yes, so I work with uh, child care providers every day, and one of my favorite things about working in this field is so often uh, the entry into the field can be through parenting, through your own lived experience of having and raising children. So many of the teachers that I work with started with their children in the care of the center or the provider that they once brought their children to. Um, in terms of linking that then with accessibility, it's really hard for those interested in the field who are parents of young children to find work if you aren't able to also find care for your children and afford it. So that is kind of a double-edged sword to begin with. Um, secondly, I work with a lot of providers who, in whatever reason the children in their center may end up losing funding or losing benefits through any number of um, funding mechanisms. And when that happens, children, um, families have to pull their children from care. That's a disruption in stability. It's a disruption in staffing for uh, the provider who maybe once had 14 children in a toddler, large toddler classroom, and now they have 10. That's a big difference in how you make payroll for that month. So providers themselves say, when funding is unstable, it is unstable for me as, as someone who supports staff development and keeping this a professional field. Um, there was one other point, but I think I'm going to, I'll stop. No, the last thing I'll say is um, this is an all hands on deck situation. So there is no one project or initiative as Council Member Rebecca Nicker said, that is addressing all of this. And so, yes, the wage gap is real and it needs to be fixed. But to say we're not going to do that because it doesn't entirely fix it, nobody is entirely fixing this situation. We need to all work together to address the different pieces of this puzzle, that, um, including labor and wages. Okay. Um, I think the next question really uh, leads into this, uh, what you've just been talking about. Um, 
there are already, as you know, several programs in place for early childhood learning. Um, the questioner mentions the discovery clubs, rec centers. There's also um, child care assistance, Head Start, and so on. Um, if this is an all-in effort, why not simply expand those other programs rather than duplicate administrative and other costs by starting a whole new program with presumably a new uh, financial structure as well? Um, so when I think about providers such as Discovery Club, Rec Check, um, community center programming, um, providers who serve children after school, those are really unique focuses. So that implies a really unique schedule, really unique staffing, and uh, an age-focused developmentally as well. So families have a much different access and opportunity once their children start kindergarten, and that's some of the um, settings that um, were just referred to. We're really, I, I, I'm thinking about that this is really something but I did also mention Head Start and uh, the school's early childhood education. Yeah, so currently, yeah, currently through St. Paul Public Schools, there's an offering of pre-K, pre which serves children who are four on or at, uh, before September 1st. There's early childhood family ed, which at its max is two days a week for two hours a day. Um, and so, that is not comprehensive by any means. In addition, during this planning process, the Office of Early Learning acknowledged that currently St. Paul Public Schools does not have the capacity to serve the number of children that are needed in our city at a full-time or even part-time basis. My own program within special ed, we are struggling to provide enough settings given the need. And so um, we need to really think about how we work together as a city with existing providers and utilizing the resources that we have within the zero to five population before children get to elementary. And, and to the question about child care assistance and early learning scholarships, which are the two types of subsidy available to help families afford child care, um, there's simply just not enough funding. So there are hundreds of kids on the wait list right now for Head Start, there's hundreds of kids on the wait list for St. Paul Public Schools pre-K, and there's hundreds of kids on the wait list for scholarships and child care assistance because there's just not enough funding. We have kids who are on wait lists until they turn five. So they spend those five years of critical developmental time on a wait list. Actually, usually they don't spend that much time because parents figure they're not gonna <laughs> ever make it, so they drop off the wait list, right? Um, in terms of getting those other governments to expand funding, one of them being the federal government, um, and one of them being our state government. So, as Martha said, we are not letting up the pressure on, on advocacy at the state and the federal level. We absolutely need more funding from the federal and the state level. But, there have been advocates, as Dr. Gunner probably knows, because I think you've been one of them, for decades at the state and the federal levels for full funding. And just like Section 8, and just like all these other programs, right, they're, they're, the funding just hasn't expanded. Even in 2023, when we had the DFL trifecta, everything was going to be solved, right? Uh, the gap was this big, and they made this much progress towards closing it. There's a $39 million gap just in St. Paul, just for zero to two-year-olds, just below 185% poverty after the 2023 funding, which, by the way, is one-time funding. So we are going to keep advocating to the state. But sometimes, if you keep doing the same thing over and over, it doesn't work, it's time to try something new. And one thing that we have found in Minnesota that often works to get the state to take action is when cities do it first. We saw this with all-day kindergarten. If you were a kindergartner before 2016, you did not have all-day kindergarten funded by the state. The, the reason that became funded by the state was because school districts started funding it, local school districts, on their own. And finally, the state was motivated to take action. Other policies like the indoor smoking ban. St. Paul led the way on that. Other cities followed suit. And then the state said, oh, they're all getting crazy. This is just a patchwork. We better take action. So our hope with this initiative, and we will continue advocating to the state, and our dollars are last dollar in. So we will make sure that all families first get any help they're eligible for from the state and the federal government, and our dollars will plug the gap. So we will continue taking all that help. And we will be advocating to the state. But this will sunset after 10 years. We'll have served thousands of kids in that time. 
And our hope is that by that time, other cities will have followed suit. I was just speaking to the League of Women Voters, Edina, two months ago. They heard about us. They're interested. Northfield is interested. Minneapolis is always eating our dust, but I'm sure they'll eventually be interested. <laughs> and, in, and in 10 years, that this will finally be when the state does step up. Great. OK, um, moving on, but staying on the issue of money, we have a question here. Would St. Paul residents use St. Paul dollars for daycare uh, centers outside the city? In other words, would they be allowed to use dollars for under this plan? The requirement would be that uh, you know the program is available to St. Paul residents for use at uh, use at centers and programs in St. Paul. Okay. So it would keep the dollars in the city. Okay. And then uh, we might as well put all the money questions together. Uh, if St. Paul property taxes go up, I'm afraid that people will leave the city. And I'm going to join that to a question that I have uh, about the timing of this issue. Uh, currently, we have serious pro problems with homelessness, with underhoused families. We have a shortage of police officers and perceptions of deteriorating public safety. In addition, St. Paul residents have just sustained a double-digit increase in property tax levies uh, for this year, plus a boost in sales tax. Given all of that, can you justify additional taxes for this issue at this particular time? Aren't there other issues that need to be addressed first? Yeah. So first of all, as the city council member here, I think I, I should speak to this first. Mm -hmm. I absolutely acknowledge that taxes are a huge burden, and I am talking mm -hmm. to my constituents about this issue and other issues, and I am hearing it. I am hearing the tax fatigue. I'm hearing the, the concern that people will be priced out of their homes, not be able to stay in the city, and that is real. At the same time, there is no way to expand access to childcare or to anything else that we care about without investing in it. There's no time when it will be free. There's no level of government that can do it for free. Um, and there's no time that will be less expensive than now. So um, while I wish, and, and you know, sometimes you don't choose the moments when these issues coalesce, right? This has been coming together for seven years. There's community energy. There's momentum behind it. It's on the ballot because of all of that work. Um, would I choose the, the year right after the sales tax was introduced by the mayor? Not necessarily. <laughs> Um, but this is, this is when it's in front of us and we have this opportunity to say yes or no, and that's really important. It is in front of voters. So the city council is not going to make this decision and the mayor's not gonna make this decision. The reason that we're putting it on the ballot is because it's ultimately up to you. If St. Paul voters say, I'm done, I'm not paying another cent, this won't pass. Um, the tax burden is $16 for the average household increasing each year for 10 years. So you'll pay $16 more in the first year, $32 more in the second year, $48 more in the third year. My math is not great. <laughs> By year 10, $160 more than at year zero for the average household, which is estimated at $275,000. If you have a house that's worth more, you might pay more. In contrast, the mayor is proposing an $132 increase this year. So that is, um, in terms of the scale of the tax that we're talking about, it is relatively small compared to those other taxes. But what I think my responsibility as a council member is, is to make sure that any other investments we're making have the return that this does. This has return. This is the kind of thing that helps people not become homeless, that helps us not have to spend those extra dollars on undiagnosed special education needs, that helps us not have to spend dollars on things that we could have fixed beforehand. But any other time that we're talking about using tax dollars, we need to make sure it has that same return. And I hope you'll hear us when we're talking in our budget cycle this year asking those really tough questions of the mayor and of his administration to try to bring that, that proposed tax increase down. Return is the magic word, and I have a question actually for Daniel Cox. This is the first question that uh, spe specifies uh, a respondent. So Daniel Cox, 16 to 1 return, you mentioned. What does that mean? Can you define return in that sense? For sure. So return in this instance means uh, basically future economic growth and cost savings uh, in public spending. So that is uh, improvements in outcomes, less kids in GV, uh, economic growth directly linked, uh, more people in, directly in the work pay, workplace and paying local taxes and economic expansion. Um, I think I said public safety uh, already. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, I, you know, I'm not like the policy expert on this panel, but um, the, 
that like that's the core of it. Uh, you know, early learning is you know if we're serious about addressing all of the of the issues that were uh, named in the question mm -hmm. the question addressed to Rebecca previously. You know, early learning is how we get at some of the structural sources there. Uh, it is very clearly demonstrated that like investing in early learning means better public safety outcomes. It means better economic growth. It means uh, you know a more stable and healthy and better city economy in the long run. And so if we if these are our serious concerns, this is part of how we address them. Uh, it's not, you know, it seems counterintuitive to be like, how do we make our streets safer? How do we have better public safety? Well, we, in, we invest in early learning. We, we put money in childcare, but it is how we do this so that we have change in the long term. So we're not just addressing symptoms and fighting the same problem that we were fighting yesterday, today, and on and on and on again into the future. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to? Although the question was addressed to you, Daniel. <laughs> so, um, something here. The study on which the 16 to 1 was based, the teachers in that program had master's levels in education. The kids had been very poor. It was a really extremely high quality program. So we can't expect the 16 to 1 with what's being proposed. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it won't do a good job. But that 16 to 1 is like, well, I wish we really could do that kind of early childhood education. We'd be in terrific shape. Uh, Connecticut's closer. Yep. There's a little bit of a six, that's a six to one. Um, and one of the things that I think is important for people to realize is it's not that these kids are going to come to school and they're going, their reading scores are necessarily going to be, because that tends to fade out. What doesn't fade out is they can regulate themselves better. They are less likely to get in trouble with the law. They're more likely to be able to hold down jobs and buy homes and pay taxes when they get older. So this is what we call the soft stuff, but it's a lot of what you learn in early childhood education. How to get along with others, how to play well, how to follow directions. <laughs> those things are critical, and those are the years when you're really picking up a lot of that. And kids who are in unregulated settings are not getting that. In fact, they may be getting the opposite, how to beat up each other and stay toys. <laughs> and, and if I could, just because I think we, we keep talking about the return in terms of the children themselves, right? Mm -hmm. How they will be when they grow up. But the, the, the magic thing about childcare mm -hmm. is that it's not just the parent, the children, it's the parents right away. As Martha said, parents can't accept a job and can't advance themselves and can't get an education if they don't have childcare. Tony Sana, uh, who's one of our strong supporters and who's the leader of the Sana Foundation, started a workforce development program as part of his foundation. And he was despondent to see that a lot of the graduates of his workforce development program after graduation did not go on to accept jobs that they were qualified for. And he found out it was because of lack of childcare. So he is now starting a child care center to go along with his workforce development program because he recognizes that those two things are linked. American businesses lose $57 billion a year due to lack of child care. So this is an economic issue, not just a do the right thing issue. And if we're serious about gender equity in the workforce, we know who it is who tends to stay home when we don't have child care. Yeah. Yeah. Following, up, uh, following up on that, to, to throw a statistic, uh, there is a report I, I recall reading that demonstrated that uh, app, um, Post-COVID, 20% less women in re-entered the workforce than men uh, due, to, uh, due to lack of child care. Um, we've got just time for a few more, a couple more questions, so uh, let me move on. Uh, there's still a lot of questions. Um, one more numerical type, tax dollar type question. Um, uh, um, you alluded, uh, Rebecca, to $16 the first year, uh, rising to $160 by year 10, the average levy on the average house. Um, commercial properties in downtown St. Paul, their valuation has continued to fall since COVID. How would the additional, or would there be an additional impact on homeowners uh, if they are forced to assume additional tax burdens because of the uh, decline of uh, property tax valuations, and would that change that 16 to 160 figure? That's a great question. There's no question that our downtown has to be successful in order for the rest of our city to be successful. I represent downtown St. Paul, and it's what keeps me up at 3 a.m. every morning, not a newborn, 
Um, my newborn is downtown St. Paul. Um, and, and so it is something that, and, you know, we can do multiple things at once. So while I'm working hard on this initiative, downtown St. Paul economic vitality is my other priority. And we are in a, in a tough time right now. So if, if commercial property taxes and values fall, it does get shifted to residents. It's not quite that simple because we also receive help from surrounding jurisdictions. If their commercial properties rise, we actually get some of those dollars through something called fiscal disparities. It's complicated. Um, but I think the main point is that Ramsey County Assessor's Office can only estimate, you know, based on today, what's the average household going to see um, and so it's very hard to predict out 10 years into the future. One thing that I think is important to know, though, is that the amount of money that we're bringing in is fixed. So $2 million is coming in in year one, then $4 million, $6 million, $8 million, up to $20 million. That's what leads to that 16, 32, 48. That number stays fixed, which means that if our property, our tax base expands, which it has expanded every year, you the property tax impact will be less, right? Because the denominator will be growing. So it's actually a conservative estimate as to how much everyone will pay because it assumes that our tax base stays flat. So I think that that's just an important uh, note to keep in mind that may counter some of those other economic shifts that we just can't predict right now. Thank you. Uh, I guess we've got time for just one more question. We have a number of questions on implementation, how this plan would be implemented, uh, why aren't there more details, that kind of thing. I, I'm going to try and just roll it all into one and say, uh, for each of you on the panel, what is the most important thing that you'd like the audience to know about implementation? And if that's too vague, what would this plan call for on day one? And I'll just give you each a, a crack at that if you'd like. I can start more time. <laughs> uh, I, the most important thing I want people to know about this initiative is that there is a plan. And we can email that plan out to everyone who comes tonight. We can share the link to it online. I encourage you to read the 48 pages for yourself. It was written by Dr. Nicole Logan-Jones, who is a former St. Paul Public Schools Office of Early Learning educator and a foremost expert on early childhood development herself, as well as a, a child of Rondo and extremely rooted in the St. Paul community. It is a solid plan. Um, and on day one, we're going to be ready to implement that plan because we've had seven years worth of work um, and Dr. Jones has written out exactly what the first year needs to call for. For sure. Uh, I would highlight that this is, you know, there have been citywide policy programs passed by ballot initiative in the past where there has not been this level of planning. Uh, you know, there is an intense amount of you know, of documentation, of written proposals that have been accepted by the city council um, that will be the basis of what it goes into practice on the first day. Um, you know, there have been so many, you know, like committees and working groups and, uh, you know, gathering of feedback from parents and providers and policy experts uh, that have gone into it, this and brought this to this point. And I think one thing that this proposal does not lack is uh, planning and detail. Um, the plan is 45 pages long, and you'll get a year-by-year -year detailed level of specificity around what to expect at each and every stage of the planning of, of this cycle. So, we actually do have it hosted, but it is uh, created and owned by the city council, so it's also on the city council's page, hosted in there. I think in the council agendas. Yeah. Uh, it, People give me an email, I'm happy to email it out to folks as well. Um, I have it like downloaded on my computer to uh, send to folks as requested, so happy to do that. We're, we're out of time. Um, no, we can put that on our website as well. Yes, we, okay. we have it on the St. Anthony Park. Oh, beautiful. Park. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're out of time. I, I did say to someone at the beginning, if we have time, we'll take uh, questions from the audience that you can ask on your feet. If there's anybody who thought of something during the, um, the program and just wants to ask it some question that hasn't been asked uh, prior, one question. Anybody in the audience? Now's your chance. Spring to your feet. And, and I think we can stick around. <laughs> okay, there you go. Where will you get... Speak loud. Stand up and speak loud. Where will you get all these teachers, these providers for uh, making this happen if they not have enough money to live on that salary. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I understand the question. So where will the providers 
Are you, are you well, wondering if there are enough current providers? Yeah, well, yeah. Yes, there will have to be more if there are more if children to be served. Yes. So um, most providers that I work with across the city in a number of settings say, we're ready. We're ready and we'll be ready. I want to hire more teachers. I can hire more teachers. The difference is we don't have the funding to do so. So if I know that three children can enroll in my setting and they have the funding available to do so, I can open a next classroom, I know who to hire, and I can provide care to more children. The, the, the difference is the funding. So providers are out there, teachers are out there, people are ready. Thank them. you very much. Thanks, everyone. Um, Rita, did you want to say yeah, something? I, I, did, I did have a question. Is a part of your program including funding training for educators? Or is it only funding the child care itself? Yeah. Please explain. Uh, so, as Martha said earlier, we, we really want this to be a focused program that doesn't promise to do everything for everybody. Um, and we only have 2 million, 4 million, 6 million, et cetera. So, and we want to be able to serve as many children as we can. So rather than duplicating efforts that are already happening, there is a lot of training out there. There are resources out there for providers. But what's often missing is that link between someone who's working full time every single day in their home taking care of children and may not have the opportunity to be doing extensive research on training programs and that person who can help connect them. So part of this program is hiring staff within our Office of Financial Empowerment for this new program that will work with providers to let them know what those training and those resources are, but not duplicating things that already exist with our limited dollars. Programs like Think Small have a grow your own right. program so that providers can keep providing and get support in improving quality as they're continuing to provide. So, you know, give to Think Small. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're out of time. Thank you all very much. We really appreciate it. And I'd like to thank our, our panel, um, Megan Gunner, Megan Gunner, sorry, Rebecca Nager, Daniel Cox, Martha Iguera. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you. The program would not have been a success with all, without all the great questions from the audience. And thank so you thank to you. the St. Anthony Park Board. Thank you. Yes. yes. <laughs> to, our, um, to our production team. Oh, yeah. The same old name the network. Ah, really? Yeah. Anybody I failed to mention, we thank you all. <laughs>